It's only entertainment. Welcome back to The Talking Hedge. I'm Josh Kincaid, Capital Markets Analyst and host of your Cannabis Business Podcast. My guest today is Robert Beasley. He's the Chief Executive Officer of Fluent. They're a vertically integrated cultivar, cultivar processor, formular, and retailer of premium medical cannabis, trading under the ticker symbol o, uh, on the OTC markets, CNTMF is their ticker symbol. Robert, thanks for being back on The Talking Hedge. Hi, thanks for having me again. Appreciate it. Uh, let's dive right into I uh, just picking up on our last conversation about, uh, you know, you kind of getting into the Florida markets uh, and, and getting some serious traction and expanding. But before we get to all of all of that, I kind of want to just kind of touch base on where you're at in the Florida market. Can you kind of just explain um, basically how has cannabis evolved in Florida since you guys inception? Well, it's been kind of a long road for this particular company. As you know, it was a first mover in the market in Florida under the, the Knox symbol um, prior to going public as consortium or fluent. The uh, first mover advantage, though, for this particular company was a little bit wasted. Uh, the green rush, as it were, back in 2015, 2016, incentivized um, what I would call lateral growth or horizontal growth. And so this company rather than compete and fix in Florida, uh, went out and, and obtained licenses in other states and ended up being horizontally very broad and then and, and without a lot of developmental depth. In the meantime, uh, its um, competitors that had an equal fair start, mainly TrueLeave, uh, they continue to grow and prosper, invest in Florida and develop a footprint. That's how we end up now with a scenario where TrueLeave is the largest by far. Uh, there's there's the rest of us and TrueLeave as far as the segregation of, of, of cannabis in Florida. So we had to re revive ourselves. We had to come back out of the ashes and figure out a way to become competitive. Um, luckily, we did so not too late. Um, our focus uh, was to increase production and focus on high quality flour. At that time, and this was January of 20, going into September of 20, when I became CEO, um, the market in Florida was not very competitive on quality. It had plenty of quantity or some quantity, but not quality. And so our focus immediately was let's target quantity, uh, quality because it's coming. Uh, we, I had been in operations out in Oregon and understood what that West Coast quality market looked like. And I think my first memo to the board of this company was you sell mediocre quality quantity and quality uh, weed. Good news, so do all your competitors. Uh, and so uh, the race for quality is on. Uh, we got there first. Uh, that allows us, allowed us to rise up in the ranks from number 15 to now number six uh, in Florida, uh, fastest growing cannabis company in Florida. Uh, and now the West Coast has arrived. And so what are the current changes? The current changes are um, cookies and Jungle Boys and those other quality markers of products have come in, although they've been a little bit more media splash than they have been competition. They, they really had a kind of a slow launch, uh, which is typical of coming into a East Coast vertical state. Uh, it's just not as easy to do a full vertical as it is to enter at the retail level. Um, so we've seen uh, those entries um, that, that just, that's caused the discussion of quality to start. Um, I kind of compare it to the wine industry in the 80s when I was uh, much too young to be drinking wine. You know, everybody from California drank white Zinfandel. And it took a while to learn that um, there was other things out there. And so Florida's learning. Florida's uh, graduating in quality. And that's the major change. As far as competition goes, um, you know, the MSOs have bought up the uh, other smaller independents. There really are no independents anymore in Florida. I, there's, no, there's no little guys. Uh, and they're pouring a lot of resources into building footprint. I know that uh, Sunnyside, which was a Cresco company, had 20 something stores under construction last year. Um, they've suffered the same drawbacks and construction delays and everything that the rest of us have. Um, and so just having money isn't enough. You have to also go through all of the other benchmarks and hoops. So competition's increasing, still plenty of market share. Um, we only have 800,000 patients or customers, if you would, uh, but there's still plenty of market share and there's still plenty of footprint left in Florida to cover. True. Um, I, I want to get into some of that competition, I guess, starting up with a cure leaf because they had to leave Oregon and they left Colorado and California as well, um, stating that they, they just couldn't compete. So they had to go to a limited license state, probably to sell stuff against, um, you know, cheaper competitors, whatever, not, not really growing a uh, quality cannabis to your point. 
Um, so I'm curious what your what your take is on that and um, what your approach is on product development selection to meet those needs and preferences for your customers. Well, it's about diversity. Uh, and in Florida, you know, so you start with uh, the fact that you're vertical, which means your business segment is three independent silos. You have a retail, a manufacturing and packaging and logistics, and then you have cultivation. So you have to do three companies in one. If you are a larger format MSO and you're seeking to be more expansive in um, in quantity and, and cover the state, then you're going to build, like you've seen with Cureleaf and others, these large facilities. And the larger you get in format, the more output, but the less controls you have. It makes a lot of sense. It's the difference between Anheuser-Busch and these craft artisanal beers. And so um, what we've tried to do is a little of both. Within our system, we have outdoor greenhouses, we have climate controlled greenhouses, we have indoor large space, and then we have in, indoor craft artisanal space. And so the idea is to find a product stream that fits every product category. And of course, in Florida, <clears throat> cannabis doesn't like to grow here. It didn't grow here naturally. It doesn't like wet feet and it doesn't like moisture. And we have plenty of both. And so in Florida, the trick is to produce at your lowest cost of goods sold for the product line you intend to produce. So, for instance, you wouldn't produce an A-quality flower facility and, and use that purely for distillates. You may make some distillates out of it, but you could make a distillate out of a lower quality uh, feed product. And so getting the right diversity of input is really the key to surviving in a state like Florida. Mm -hmm. And yet there's a lot of competition coming in. You mentioned cookies, and I think on their first day, of they made... I think their revenue on day, and don't quote me on this, but I think their revenue from that one day was as much as Florida made in the previous month. And to me, that's a lot of hype. And it's it's curious that Jungle Boys and, and Cookies can gain that much hype when I haven't tried a lot of their products. I did go to Vegas and I tried some of Cookies stuff and it was not good. Stizzy's was not good. They must do a really good job of branding and they have loyalty no matter how bad their products are. Um so what, what are you guys doing different? Are you prioritizing marketing versus educating customers and stores on different strains, products and benefits, or what's the difference? So, and, you know, and cookies could have good product and does have good product. It doesn't mean that everything they sell is a hit. It just means that they, you know, trend towards a uh, higher quality. Uh, Stizzy is a whole different uh, business model and, and it's more of a brand than a product. And so it really doesn't compare, but it kind of does relate me, relate me back to your question, which is, what is a brand? Well, a brand in Florida due to the advertising restrictions is really not that valuable. I've had to break the hearts of many West Coast brands by saying, I'm sorry, but what you have to offer me in exchange for the 10 or 15 percent you want me to pay you is your marks, your logo, your advertising, none of which we can use in Florida because the restrictions are so strict. So a brand in Florida is only successful and translates from the West to the East Coast if it comes with a product with it or a particular formula or recipe or something else other than just a sticker stamp or logo. And so what cookies is offering is a brand and a merchandising brand and they're very successful at merchandising, as you pointed out, but behind what they're offering, they have a genetic stock, they have formulations, they have recipes. So we have been very careful about rejecting brands. However, we do have two relationships that are an exhibit of what I'm talking about. We have our Smokies relationship, Great guys out of Oregon, father-son team. They've, they've, they've grown a little bit. They're not small anymore, but they they provide a brand and a logo, but they also provide formulations and product uh, packaging and so forth ideas that help us put something on the shelf. So it's more than just a sticker or a label. Mm -hmm. Same thing with our Freedom Town connection. Our Freedom Town guys, they're just as good as anybody at Cookies. They provide genetics. They're just as good. And we've given them a facility that allows to allow that gen those genetics to reach their highest potential, just like a professional athlete. And so it's not just a brand, although Freedom Town is a brand, but they're in the they're in the grow facility every day, talking to those plants and playing Bach or whatever they do to make it to make those plants uh, perform. And that's a whole lot different than a California brand where they put your sticker or logo on on a device or so forth. And so to be successful in Florida, you have to be more than a logo. Mm -hmm. And yet you're moving into other regions um, like Pennsylvania. C can you compare that to another market and then maybe talk about how you evaluate um, both financial and operational performance for potential M&A targets? Uh, it, as far as Pennsylvania or as a whole? As a whole. Yeah. So um, 
we've had a, a, an interesting evolution uh, at Fluent. Uh, you know, as I said to you, uh, Fluent was a good example of in the early days of being a first mover in cannabis, you could do everything wrong and still survive. And they did. They did everything wrong and still survived. Um, and then we came along and we started uh, straightening it up, fixing the, you know, putting the trimmings on the curtains and so forth. And we got better and better. Our life of M&A was starting out when I first came on was, you know, all the vultures were circling. We were a good bargain because we had good bones. Uh, we had good licenses, but nothing else. And then after a while, as our operations came online, our revenues and EBITDA picked up, all of a sudden we started getting a different category of buyer, a buyer that recognized what we had to offer as an ongoing concern, not just our bones. And then the latter phase, which is where we are today, has really been the only true compliment I've had in this industry, which is our recent M&A discussions are very, very different than our old M&A discussions. They are, you're a good operator. You know what you're doing. You've brought this from nothing to something. You're efficient. You know how to run a vertical and verticals are very hard. The, the potential M&A candidate now comes to us and says, we cut the bus. We have a license. We even built a facility. We just haven't quite figured out how to put all the pieces together. We don't quite know what we're doing as evidenced by our failure to achieve revenues or, or any kind of bottom line. Can we get together? And, and those are golden opportunities for us. We're not interested in taking on someone's bad decisions and bad debt, but there are plenty of operators out there. There's some in Pennsylvania, there's Ohio. We're, we're getting good looks all the time. And we're going to find those partnerships. That's what I'm looking for. We're looking for someone that says, we got this far, we need help. Or, hey, we're just like Fluent was two years ago. We, 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 went, we, we rose up on certain economics. I'm talking about wholesale in Pennsylvania. Those economics fell apart and now we're in trouble. Can, we, can you help? And, and that is the opportunity we're looking for. You know, we're not interested in buying someone's old mistakes. We're not interested in paying top dollar. Our share price doesn't allow us to do a big M&A transaction where we pay you off in shares. But if you want to get together and, and form a go forward plan that allows us a larger footprint and then borrows into what we have learned, that's what we want to do. Hmm. So let, let's move on from, uh, from Pennsylvania to Texas, because you kept that even though you're not really able to do much, to my understanding, that you're just kind of sitting on these licenses waiting for that market to open up. But yet you liquidated Puerto Rico. And so I'm curious about that transaction, because Puerto Rico, I've said, you know, with uh, what's now called Act 60, um, the only place in the world as an American business where individual where you can go and not be forced to pay federal income tax, you could, in theory, during federal legalization, route all of your sales and production and distribution out of there. Uh, and and have that advantage. What was the decision on on liquidating Puerto Rico versus keeping Texas? And you know, you make a very compelling point about not liquidating Puerto Rico and keeping it. And maybe I should have had your advice at the time because <laughs> those considerations were on the table. The problem with Puerto Rico was we had poured an awful lot of money and we did still did not have a functional facility. And then a storm kind of cleaned up the rest, and it was just really a start over proposition. We had to grow by contraction. We were so horizontally thin that we just couldn't support all of the ideas and dreams that were out there. And so we had to stick with what we knew. And, and what I could see was clear. Florida was the moneymaker. Pennsylvania is just left on idle. I had one goal in Pennsylvania. We had one store, but a license for three. The goal was simple. Get two more stores open and then see what happens. We're, we're cash flow positive in Pennsylvania. And the regulations are coming to us. We know it's going to go recreational. We're, we may get more stores with recreational. We may have an opportunity to go vertical with one of these partnerships I, just, I talked about. And so we have a plan on Pennsylvania that is not necessarily limbo, but it's kind of a wait and see now that we have our act together. Texas has been the interesting one. Uh, we've had an opportunity to sell Texas several times, um, but we're one of three and we're really more than one of three because our, our one independent competitor is, is, is really has a low footprint. And then we have Parallel as a competitor through goodness growth. And, and they're not really doing much either due to their issues. And so we might very well be the shining star in Texas, which is a great opportunity, but also a little intimidating because it's an enormous state. I was just out there. I've been appointed to the uh, regulatory advisory committee. Um, I will tell you in a, in a highly regulated industry, your regulators are your partners. They're your business partners. They can do you in like they did us in in Michigan, or they can really help you like Texas is helping. Uh, DPS, which is, uh, as the director put it, they didn't ask for it. They were handed this responsibility. They have the state troopers, the guns, and the Texas Rangers, and now weed. And uh, they're, uh, they're finding an odd fit there, but they really care about getting this program to be successful. They really want it done right. 
And uh, that's all we need. We just need an energetic regulatory partner. And we have that with DPS. So now we look at the economics of Texas. I was just there. Um, our facilities in Schulenburg, which is just kind of east west of nowhere. Um, and so we really can't try to develop a retail presence there. Um, we're closest to Houston. So I focused on the Houston market. 7.2 million people in Houston, third largest city in the country, growing at like 10% a year. Uh, that's enough for us. Um, we're going to focus on Houston. We got a couple stores being cited now. DPS is really helping us kind of navigate the restrictions that are there. Um, for the first time, I can tell you that we have moved Texas from the one day potential list to the go forward list. Um, we have hired a Texas president by the name of Christopher Kim. He was uh, formerly selling uh, Wagyu and Angus cattle. And so he knows his way around Texas. Great guy. And uh, we're moving. Uh, we got products approved. We got formulation done. We've got products in the vault. We're about to open a store that can't be called a store because there's no such thing in Texas. Uh, it's a satellite delivery center. Um, but from the customer's perspective, it'll look like a store. Um, and now we've just got to pioneer that market. And it feels just like Florida in 2015 and 16. There are no customers. We have to make them. We have to connect the conditions with the physicians, with the population that needs it. And we have to make those connections. And that's just grassroots work. And we're excited about doing it. Um, it's a little scary. Um, quite frankly, I wish the other two operations um, were, were ready to move as fast a pace as we are um, because it's going to be tough work alone. It's no fun being a pioneer. Uh, and there's a lot of them by the trail side. I played Oregon Trail when I was a kid. I know exactly what's going to happen to us if we don't be very, very careful. Um, but, um, but still it's, it's an amazing market, 31 million people in Texas. Yeah. Well, I mean, your experience is, is impressive. And I don't, I don't say that lightly, uh, in this industry, having the experience you have running almost a half a dozen before you got to where you're at and seeing the experience and Petri dish experiment on the West coast gives you an incredible insight. Um, so I'm personally excited to see where you go and, and I don't, I'm not trying to just, uh, say Thank that. You. Me too. <laughs> But but I am I am wondering if SOPs are scalable. So when you talk about going into Texas and looking for all of these strategic partnerships, are can you maintain that consistency in your operations and product offerings across different locations? Scalability is a key word. Um, I have I'm the I'm the head of our reading club at our company, and I re recently had all our executives read the book Voltage Effect. Um, I don't know the guy; I'm not plugging it, but it's all about scalability, and um, and that is that is either your win or your loss. Um, and so it's a great question. Here's what's key, though: is the regulations help us because they don't allow us but to produce a few product lines, and so we don't have to scale across the board. We are lucky, and, and I know this is going to sound odd to say, um, we're lucky they don't let us sell flour there, which means what? Which means I don't have to build that A-plus facility to generate that high-quality flour. I don't have to deal with short uh, logistic chains that flour demand. I can process oils. I can store those oils. Oils keep very well once in a certain form. I can put products that are very shelf-stable. Now I can wait on the customers as I build them. And so I don't have a perishable product, thanks to the regulations. And so... Yes, we can scale. We are scaling. The limitations allow us to scale. Uh, and so it's an odd way to look at it. But but the fact is, is that what I'm allowed to sell helps me scale. Mm -hmm. um, and yet you're being held back uh, as a whole because things aren't federally legalized and that's most represented in your stock price. So when doing some research, I looked at this Seeking Alpha article from September and it was from uh, Greystone Capital, and it was titled Consortium, the Most Underappreciated Cannabis Company. So they're talking about the enterprise value to your EBITDA ratio and that the valuation is down to 2.8x, but that they, being Greystone Capital, believe that the price that Consortium is mispriced. Um, average peer multiples for companies in tiers one through four, no lower than 6.7 X. The entire cannabis universe trades at 8.5 X. So Robert, why is the valuation so much lower than the competition? That is an outstanding question. And one I do not exactly know the answer to here's, here are some observations. One, when I first took the job, I, I thought that as a public company CEO, I need to, uh, I needed to know the, what's going on with our stock price, study it every day. And I, after a few months, just gave up because what I found is the stock movement is 
in 100% disconnected from our financial performance. And, and, and so because then it means I can't do anything right or wrong. Um, we would have these days, uh, we had some pretty great quarters, as you know, we're putting up numbers that any other company people would be pouring into. Um, and the stock goes down. Um, our, one of our biggest rises of stock was, I think, last October. I was having a terrible month. We lost one of our major extractors. I was down there, sleeves rolled up, trying to figure out why this piece of junk wasn't working and had engineers there. And we were without extraction capability for about 20 days. Customers never noticed it, but I stayed up all night. The stock went up the whole time. And I thought, well, wait a second. The world I live in and that world have nothing to do with each other. So why did that stock go up? And so I start studying it. Well, it's because Chuck Schumer told some folks that he thought he had the bill passed, the Safe Banking Act passed. All right. We are tied entirely to regulatory events and not at all to our economic performance. What does that tell me? Well, one, it's unfortunate because it means I can't do right. I can't do wrong. Um, and and I have to convince the investors. We have some really good shareholders. Say, look at what we're doing. Pay attention to what I'm telling you on our numbers. Pay attention to our growth levels. Pay attention to what's happening inside under the hood. I'll tell you if we've got a problem and we don't, we, we look phenomenal. We're cash flow positive. We don't have a payables past 90 days. We're one of the few MSOs. We're about to resolve our 21 tax liability. We don't have our 22 out yet. Um, you know, we, we're paying our taxes. How about that for cannabis? Um, and yet the stock trickles around at these low numbers. I think there's a lot of reasons, one of which, and, and I'm the, the last one in line in the line of experts on this, but one of which is, this company came out too early. It, it rushed out to um, be a public company a little earlier than it should have. As a result, it had that big green wave rush out and those numbers got high to start with and they could only go down at that point. So I think that tri attributes it. Um, I think we're in limited license states that are highly regulated. And, and while there's promise, every single regulatory event that I know of can only help us. We do not look down the line at a regulatory event and say that, that would be terrible for us. Um, but that promise continues to be kicked down the road. Um, you know, with DeSantis in Florida, it's not going to allow this program to increase much more than it is. He has all the cannabis program he needs for his election. Uh, and so we have what Biden's been doing, the little test balloons he's rolled up. But if he wanted to do something, he would have already done it. And so the fact is, is we are tied to those regulatory non-events. Well, what does that tell me? It's kind of like a boiling pot, I believe. We're so good and so economically strong, but yet so suppressed that if one of these events pop, I think our stock just goes through the roof. Um, now, um, that's my opinion. Um, I try to find a silver lining in this cloud because um, I'm doing my best and we look good on the inside. Um, but other than just tell people to buy shares and believe, I'm not sure what else I can do. It seems to me in my observations that the entire industry is being held back by federal legalization and only driven by fundamentals. And I thought fundamentals have been dead for 15 years. Uh, you know, people only care about technicals and they don't, no one's trading technicals on, on cannabis. It's really only based on news, but of course this is not financial advice. Um, but it's one of the reasons why I stopped trading in U S oil, uh, the ETF USO ticker symbol, because it doesn't move as it should, as you would expect it to. And so I just stopped trading it altogether your company uh, should be trading probably independent of, uh, you know, the the industry as a whole based on, uh, you know, on your fundamentals. And, and it has well, it yet. Our board knows that and, and they've got it in perspective. I've been able to convince the board, you know, we're not the company we used to be. We're something totally different now. And so when I get that call and I get them randomly um, of someone who's ready to write a check for our market cap, you know, I stop them right there and say, listen, um, you know, if you add those numbers up on the, on the ticker today, it doesn't even equal our Texas license. Uh, and so, you know, if that's the conversation you want to have, then you're way off and I'm sorry, we can't have a conversation. Uh, and so, you know, we're going to continue to hold that line. What's going to be interesting is we have a few potential growth steps that are on the near horizon. I mean, we've applied in Alabama. I think we have a good chance of getting that license. Um, again, some of this M&A activity where we merge and, and get bigger with a, a complementary footprint. Um, I'm curious about what happens then, because traditional knowledge would tell you if, if something big event happens within our company and we expand yet again in a positive way, it should have energy in the stock. But um, the way I've seen it so far, it, I bet it doesn't. Uh, I bet our stock continues to be tied to whatever's happening in Washington and, and in our state capitals. Mm -hmm. 
Yeah, I would probably agree with that. Uh, so what does happen this year? Is it going to kind of be a lame duck until the next election for the next two years? Or are we not going to expect much? Uh, it seems like safe banking comes and goes and doesn't really get anywhere. Uh, what's your anticipation for 2023 in the next year or two in the industry as a whole? So safe banking is interesting. Um, you know, I, I, I've, re I've reviewed every version of that bill and cannot find a legitimate basis for opposition. I, I really do not understand. Um, and but here's the very curious thing. It has failed. And, and, and I'm not sure. I mean, I think Chuck Schumer is going to keep working on it. Uh, and and I, I think Cory Booker has spoke positively towards it. Um, but um, here's what's really neat. I've been approached by multiple regional banks in the last couple months who've said, we're ready to get in. We're ready to receive your deposits. And I've said, well, safe banking failed. They said, yeah, we've looked at that, but um, we're tired of waiting. Uh, there's a lot of cash in your system. We want the deposits and we're ready to get in. So, you know, it's funny how cannabis developed and, and became a going business model in disregard of the federal occurrences and events. And we, at some point, the states just just ignored the federal government and their slow pace of development and recognition of this legitimate industry. I think we're right on the cusp of the banking industry doing the same. Obviously the big banks that handle the federal bonds and everything, the really big banks will not be able to. But again, I've had two regional banks that are sizable footprints tell me they are, their risk managers have, have just given up. They've given up fighting the business side. Um, then what do we need from safe banking at that point? Once we resume banking relations, uh, it may become a relic, just like a lot of this other federal issues. Um, states, uh, what's going to happen in states? I, I don't know what's going to happen in Texas. I'd like to see the legislature be a little more aggressive there. Um, their problem is that they only meet every two years and they get very distracted very quickly on a lot of other, quite frankly, much more important issues. Um, you know, that's just a, a the pace that they're at. Uh, Florida, as I've already indicated, I think everybody understands where DeSantis is. Um, you know, that agency, which is an executive agency by statute, should have already issued many more licenses than it did. It should have already done a lot of things it hasn't done. And, you know, it is not moving at the pace that everyone expected it to, even the legislature. And it could really only be one answer for that, which is that it's just not being motivated by the governor. And so while I've heard about 22 more licenses, I'm waiting and seeing what happens for real on that. Um, because I used to be on the other side of this. My litigation practice was suing the state of Florida to get them to do what they should have been doing and issue licenses. And I was never successful in that on my side. So um, I think we're kind of looking at a lame duck scenario at the federal level. We saw what Biden did. It was a, it was just a test balloon. If you think about it, the federal, the federal incarcerated prisoners for misdemeanor possession. We all knew that that was nothing. That was a big bag of nothing to see. He just wanted to watch the points suggesting to the DEA that they consider descheduling. They're an executive agency. Um, that, the, that message could have sounded a lot different, which is, hey, DEA, deschedule this um, because they're an executive agency and that's what the president has the right to do. So being soft that way, doing this measure was really just a test balloon. I've seen the Biden administration try this on other issues that cannabis is just one to see what kind of traction it gives them. I don't think anything's going to really happen to be honest with you, that is um, going to be um, a big game changer. Maybe Pennsylvania. Pennsylvania looks like it may go adult use. I, I think the general wisdom was it was absolutely going to happen. And now it's maybe not going to happen. But but but, you know, we're still greater than 50 percent. That could be huge for us. Um, and the states will continue to evolve. I'm looking forward to South Carolina and North Carolina putting their bills on. I think there's good momentum for that. I'm helping both of those states um, with the drafting of their legislation. Um, I think they've got a great opportunity to look at how it can't, how it shouldn't be done and how it should be done. You know, you're a late state to this. Uh, the Southeast is the last frontier. So you're a late state to this game. You can look at all good models and bad models and form really good legislation. And both of those um, legislative processes are in, in play and I think support. Mm -hmm. Yeah, should be interesting, uh, especially with a lot more states going on board. What will happen during the next um administration because once you have a, a few more states this year or next year and that just multiplies uh i think they're gonna be knocking on the door for for legalization pretty soon uh if more people want to learn about fluent and what you guys are doing where you're at or if investors want to get to know a little bit more where can they find you guys at 
So getfluent.com is our is our website. Um, um, I'm on LinkedIn. If you want to find me personally, send me a send me a shout out. Um, our ticker is TIUM, uh, which is the parent company consortium. We're actually trying to get that changed to something fluent related. Um, and we're on the OSC, obviously, in the OTC. Um, getfluent.com has an investor link that takes us right to, actually, I get a copy of it and our IR manager gets a copy of it. And so we try to be responsive to that and, and would love to talk to folks about their interest and, and, and maybe coming in to support our cause. And just to clarify, T-I-U-M, is that on the Canadian Stock Exchange? <laughs> it is on the CSC. Right. Okay. Good deal. All right. Um, I think with that, we're going to have to roll this one up. So I want to thank my guest, Robert Beasley, Chief Executive Officer at Fluent. Again, available on the CSC at TIUM and on OTC Markets at CNTMF. Robert, thanks again for being on The Talking Hedge. Thank you so much. I appreciate it. I'm Josh Kincaid. This is The Talking Hedge. Don't forget to like, share, and subscribe, or don't, and I'm out. Don't forget to smash that like button on your way out and check out these other videos that we've got. Thanks for listening to today's show. To check out more great cannabis podcasts, go to podconnects.com. Here's a preview of one of our other shows. Hi, it's Justin Benton, host of the Miracle Plant Podcast, where we discuss this miracle plant that goes by so many names and how it's helping people in so many extraordinary ways. So if you love this plant and you want to hear a story that tugs on those heartstrings and learn more about this plant, then head on over to the Miracle Plant Podcast. You'll be glad you did.